To be absolutely brutally clear, I have no right to be on this stage. You've got people that have dedicated more than 40 years. You've got people that have dedicated enormous financial and I'm sure other resources to make it happen. Um, I take no credit having had nothing to do with the fact that this incredible building and event are here. It has been crossing my mind. What am I supposed to say? <laughs> I was in the neighborhood looking for a slightly used elephant. Uh, 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 only driven by a school teacher on rare occasions. But uh, the actual reason I am in Mich Michigan and at this university, probably though, like most things that seem coincidental until you dig deeper, and things that always get connected, you find that it wasn't a coincidence at all. I'm here because 25 years ago, I did start a, a not-for-profit movement to get kids to be directly involved in learning by doing. I think you can academically learn a lot of things. You read it, you regurgitate it on the test. That's becoming familiar with it, and that's not bad. But even as a kid, I was very aware of the enormous difference between being comfortably familiar with something and really understanding it. Anybody can say F equals MA. You know, if Isaac Newton was such a genius writing that first order linear equation, something is equal to something times a constant, couldn't have made him the greatest mathematician or physicist of all time. But really understanding that that simple relationship works for atoms and galaxies. Pretty interesting. Until you play with stuff, you don't get an understanding. And nothing could, I think, be more true than in the area of the life sciences for that. And I think, as a kid, I was cheated, as most kids of my era, out of really getting inspired by the life sciences because it was mostly dead, smelly, slimy things onto plastic. It wasn't a hands-on learning experience. I have to tell you, I had an older brother, brilliant guy, MD, PhD. His PhD was in pharmacology. He was developing drugs for babies with cancer when I was trying to get myself through high school. And he'd need equipment, and I'd build equipment for him to deliver those drugs in my father's basement. And he went on. He was a professor of medicine at places like Yale. and. Uh, <laughs> And I continue to go make stuff for him and others. And at one point, probably three decades ago, we said, we'll write a book together, like biophysics. But we decided after one night and probably two bottles of wine, <laughs> the first 200 pages would be biology, because he was a brilliant biology guy. He knew every Latin word and how to spell it. And, and uh, then I'd write 200 pages of math and differential equations, and he wasn't really big on that stuff. And we realized that, of course, a book that's half biology and half physics is not biophysics, and in fact, more importantly, is not interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> because the interesting things in the world happen at the intersection of what all the brilliant people around the world are doing. And I think this building is kind of a, a physical representation of where we have evolved. You know, a couple of hundred years ago, it was the golden age of the early physics, electricity and magnetism, guys like Newton and then Maxwell. And a hundred years ago was the golden age of quantum mechanics. All the great physicists were alive at the same time, Schrodinger and de Broglie and Einstein. And, and today, people that don't know it, I still think, think biology really isn't a real science. It's a descriptive thing with the smelly stuff. The fact is, in my lifetime, in the last couple of decades, I think all of the world of technology that's 
created those golden ages, you know, from the transistor in the 50s to the age of computational stuff. It's all converging now on one of the really great, great, great areas that desperately needs to have its golden age. Proteomics, genomics, nanotechnology. You know. Today you can take somebody's genome and express it in such a way that I think in the lifetime certainly of all the students here, but probably in all of ours, the age of blockbuster drugs is gone. They'll design a particular drug for you, or you, or you. Eliminate the side effects. But biology, I'm a biased guy here, is finally becoming a real engineering science. <laughs> it's, it's got mathematics behind it now. <laughs> it's got computation. I mean, computational biology has sort of become the ultimate in computer science and it gives you more than Angry Birds or Twitter. <laughs> so on the one hand, I guess back to where I started, I, I think I'm, I was really invited here, and the reason I came is because when your president said come, first of all, this thing I started 25 years ago, on the same premise I think that you've been doing what you're doing, get kids hands-on, get them passionate, get them excited. Maybe you'll get faculty out of them in 30 years. But, but it's grown all over the country and all over the world. First went from 20-some-odd teams in the first year to 43,000 schools participating last year in more than 80 countries. But across the United States, while it's growing everywhere, the state of Michigan has by far exceeded the growth over the last few years of any state. And that's, I think, due to your governor, due to your universities, due to the corporate leadership. And by the way, the world knows that the automotive industry, Detroit in particular, was hard hit, more hard hit over the last couple of burps of the global economy than most places. And throughout it, the leadership of the companies in Michigan and the universities in Michigan kept doubling down on their commitment to FIRST because every one of them, the universities, the corporate leaders, your governor, governor, have said, what do you think got us into this trouble? If we lose the cutting edge in technology, if we lose the cutting edge in innovation, we'll lose the leadership that put us here in the first place. And I think it's extraordinary that the state of Michigan, it must be in the water, of which you got two thirds of the fresh water in the world, but, <laughs> but, but, but in the end, I guess it's not that surprising that I was invited here, really because of FIRST and to thank all the great supporters of FIRST. I think the same kind of vision and courage and leadership that has made FIRST in Michigan sort of now the model for first all over the country is the same kind of vision and leadership that could bring something like this. And you'll call it biology, I'll say, well, it just opened up some rooms for physics next door. And, and in these labs, I'm sure there'll be way more of what I call real science, math and computational work. But clearly, the intersection of, of biology medicine, healthcare. This is the beginning, I think, of, of the golden age of that. It's going to be, you know, certainly, it will, it will dwarf the impact of the automotive industry over the next 50 years. And the fact that Michigan has decided to take leadership there is uh, reassuring to me. It really is reassuring. And all I can say, since as I started, I had nothing to do with building this place. Um, I want to learn from it. I want to figure out how to bring that kind of vision and focus uh, to the rest of the first community and back to New Hampshire. There's a lot of leaders in government these days. There's a lot of leaders in business these days that seem to have gotten really good at figuring out the cost of everything and the value of nothing. And to come and do this, at a time like this shows that the really leadership matters and vision matters 
and I congratulate all of you, and I am sure over the next few decades, the value of this place will so outstrip whatever the hardship and costs were that nobody will even remember that. Congratulations. <laughs>